Coming now to India and Asia. I'm sure everybody here would agree with me when I say, certainly Professor Bhanu Pratap Mehta, if he's in the audience. Is he there? Yeah. That India is at a pivotal moment in its, in, our, in its history. And the world's image of India has undergone a profound change. Few can deny India's achievements during the past quarter of a century at having emerged stronger economically, increasing its GDP spectacularly from low double, di di low double digit billion US dollars to around two trillion US dollars today. And at the same time, suitably positioning itself strategically and diplomatically. India's potential rate of growth may be lower than that of China, but it consistently maintained a growth rate of around seven to eight percent for the best part of the past decade. This has dropped slightly to around 6.5 percent lately. It invests as much as 35 percent of its GDP as, and its savings rate is around 31 percent. It spends slightly less than 3% of its GDP on welfare measures, which, have helped its, which has helped lift many millions out of poverty and enable the empowerment of India's traditionally marginalized sections. Thus, and I, and I like to underline this fact, thus proving that democracy is a potent instrument even in poorer and less developed countries. I think the High Commissioner of India will fully support me on this. India's human resource potential is immense. Over half the population is below 25 years of age. India is therefore making massive investments in education, as also in health and agriculture. And I was therefore very happy to hear from John Woodward what's happening on the education front. After recently enacting a right to education law, the emphasis is now on vocational and quality higher education. At the same time, India is well aware that integration with the global economy is vital to its prosperity. It has opened up its economy incrementally, and very recently the government announced opportunities for FDI in multi-brand retail civil aviation, broadcasting, insurance, and power trade exchanges. India has also entered into multiple bilateral free trade agreements with countries in Asia and other parts of the world. On the strategic plane, India is well placed today. It does not face, and I would like to underline this fact, it does not face any existential threat. Barring the perception among one or two countries in its immediate neighborhood, India is nowhere seen as an aggressive or an expansionist power, and this has facilitated its transition into, to a major emerging power. With several countries of Asia, India now has in place a set of strategic and political military dialogue mechanisms. India's internal security dynamics may at times appear to outsiders as highly challenging. This is an area with I have a fair amount of knowledge. And I would like to stress the fact that the internal situation does not present any kind of a threat to India. Among the common problems that are often referred to are the ever-present danger of asymmetric warfare, of terrorism, India has been a victim of several high-profile terrorist attacks in recent years, but I think we have withstood this pretty well. Then there is left-wing extremism, whose ideology is a mutant of the erstwhile Maoist theory. The movement is fueled by perceptions of deprivation, exploitation, and alienation of the marginalized, accompanied, unfortunately, by, I know Kiran is here, by a misplaced sense of idealism. Violence is the late motive of the movement, 
with its supporters believing that violence is justified in order to protect the freedoms of the poorest of the poor. Some of the other areas of violence are now, I think, declining. But a new and emerging phenomena of sub-state actors and mezzanine forces supplementing and complementing activities of non-state actors is emerging. Yet, as I said, we do not see this as a major threat, and we are dealing with it uh, democratically. India's diplomatic initiatives in Asia mainly center around aid and assistance to countries in its neighborhood, on the one hand, enlarging its Look East policy and sustaining its special relationships with countries of West Asia or on the other side. India has recently constituted a development partnership administration within the Ministry of External Affairs to help consolidate and streamline all its aid programs. In Afghanistan, India has been an important factor in that country's reconstruction efforts. Over two billion US dollars have been committed by India for various people-centric and infrastructure projects, including human resource development. But we realize that diplomatic activity, uh, sorry, aid and diplomatic efforts are dependent on the presence of a viable security umbrella. So 2014 poses some kind of a question mark on this. In Bangladesh, India provides for liberalized terms of trade and financial assistance for development projects. Relations with Bhutan are special, and Bhutan is the largest recipient of Indian development aid. India is a factor in Sri Lanka's development programs, but unlike aid provided by China, most of India's development aid is intended for the reconstruction and rehabilitation and economic development of the northern and eastern provinces. I know there are members of the Tamil Congress here. I hope they're happy about that. <coughs> With countries like Vietnam, India has in place an arrangement for mutual assistance. India today does face something of a diplomatic grid gridlock when it comes to dealing with current realities in West Asia. The beginning of the decade witnessed a churn in the region in the wake of the Arab Spring, and it has not yet been possible for India to reach a proper modus vivendi as to what the nature of the relationship should be. Our stakes are very considerable here. The Sunni Arab world is home to nearly six million resident Indians. It is also a major source of energy. India also has strong civilization and other links with Iran, which is a major attraction for India's substantial Shia major, minority. India also, uh, Iran also provides India with energy as also as an alternative route to Afghanistan and Central Asia. India is therefore juggling with these issues, but is hamstrung to some extent by the fact that the new crop of leaders in West Asia are very different from those with India dealt with when non-alignment was perhaps the, the signal most important pole of India's foreign policy. A word about India's defense capabilities. These have greatly expanded in recent years. And I wish to stress the fact that India has enough capability, both deployed and in reserve, to convince others about its ability to deter any aggressive moves against it. India has perhaps the fourth largest army in the world. It has a well-regarded blue water navy. Its plans to have a two-carrier battle group in the near future have slowed down slightly late, uh, lately, but the Navy can boast of a significant complement of modern ships, aircraft, and missiles. The Air Force is being modernized and is poised to acquire several squadrons of state-of-the-art aircraft. India has in place a credible nuclear deterrent. Its nuclear doctrine, 
no doubt emphasizes no first use. But India has in place a reliable, credible second nuclear, a second strike capability, enough to deter any threat, <clears throat> any possible threat. Its missile capabilities, comprising both the Agni and Prithvi series of missiles, as also supersonic cruise missiles, is expanding rapidly. With the successful test of the 5,000 kilometer range Agni-5 missile, capable of carrying a nuclear warhead, as also MIRVs, India's <coughs> strategic weapons reach has become vastly enlarged. Coming to strategic rivalries in Asia, the sad part is that strategic rivalries are on the increase in the Asian region. Most analysts tend to see the main rivalry in Asia as between India and China, though both countries disclaim the existence of such rivalry. There's also talk of the region becoming a theater of great power rivalry, especially after the US, up after US announcement regarding its Asia pivot and <clears throat> reiterating, reiteration that it is a Pacific power. I think that's a bit of overblown, overblown rhetoric at the moment. To some extent, <clears throat> China and India <clears throat> are destined by geography to be rivals. <clears throat> Neighbors, <clears throat> sorry, neighbors with large populations, old civilizations, rich and venerable cultures, and disputes with regard to their borders. The two countries are nevertheless, and I, I'm sure everybody in this room understands this, the two countries are far apart civilizationally. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, said, um, the two countries are nevertheless far apart civilizationally and in their makeup. Elected accountability in India is an important point of difference. Moreover, Chinese scholars appear unable to comprehend the true nature of India's ethnic, religious, ideological, and economic makeup. I say this since I've seen this at first hand. In my years as a national security advisor, one of my responsibilities was to be the pointsman for border talks with China. And my counterpart was a was very learned Dai Bingo, with whom I developed a fairly close relationship. And in the six years that we talked, I think 12 times, he never could quite understand how India thought or how India believed. One particular point I would like to mention was on one of our visits, we used to alternate between talks in China and in India. I took him down south for a, a small retreat in, in, a, in a town called Kunur in the, in the Nilgiris in, in the south. And I drove, we drove through the condon, cantonment in Wellington, I think some of those who have been here. When we reached Kono, Mr. Daibingo asked, asked me, did we drive through a cantonment? I said, yes, why? And he said, even President Hu Jintao couldn't have taken you through a Chinese cantonment. I, I'm just mentioning this, the, 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 the attitudes or mental ap approach to, uh, so they can not quite understand so also the sort of very varied ethnic and um, <clears throat> linguistic map that we have. <clears throat> 